Okay, so back to the head and neck. Uh, this week I've been talking about, well I was talking about endocrine organs in, in general. I was mostly doing the embryology, but we've been doing a bit of endocrinology this week. So we talk about the anatomy of the endocrine organs, the gonads we've already looked at, but we do the others. Anyway, starting at the top, have you guys heard of the HPO axis or the, you know, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis or gonadal axis or things like that? What I want to talk about today is the pituitary gland. Which is in the head. Which is a key endocrine organ and a key organiser of other endocrine organs. But I'm obviously not going to talk about the endocrinology because I'm an anatomist. So what we'll look at is where is the pituitary gland? What bones does it live in? What other structures are nearby? Uh, how is it linked to the hypothalamus, with which it shares a, an interesting relationship? What's the blood supply? What's the venous drainage? And that sort of thing, all right? So as with any head and neck anatomy, the biggest issue I find is, particularly stuff inside the head, is trying to get a three-dimensional understanding of where a structure is, particularly if it's a squidgy bit of brain, um, and whereabouts it, you know, whereabouts it is within the three-dimensional space of the cranial cavity, what other things are nearby. The pituitary gland isn't too bad. Look, that's the pituitary gland there. It's classically described as about the size of a pea. Fair enough. Um, and it's sat within a little, little curve of bone. So it's sat surrounded by bone here. But this is obviously a mid-sagittal section through the head and neck, right down the midline. So the pituitary gland is, is in the midline. There's only one of them. Many organs have a left and right versions, don't they? But uh, the pituitary gland, there's just a central one. Do you see the level we're at here? So here's the nose, here are the eyes, look. So we're about here, here's the nasal cavity. Now the bone that the pituitary gland lies within is the sphenoid bone. So if we look inside the skull, skull, we see quite a prominent thing. The sphenoid bone is here, this here. And if you can actually see, when you look at a skull, if you can see the suture of the sphenoid bone, it kind of makes this nice butterfly straight shape, right? Two big triangles. So right in the middle here, there's this obvious depression, and in there, that is where the pituitary gland lives in life. The depression is called the cella tersica, literally Turkish saddle. It's a type of horse riding saddle that, whoop, you know, kind of goes up quite high at the front, which is what this bit of bone does, curves around the pituitary gland. Do you remember that the, uh, the internal carotid artery is right next to the cella tersica on either side, right? It's got these little, little holes there. So, the pituitary gland lies within the cella turcica. It's mostly surrounded by bone. It has the cavernous sinuses, the dural venous sinuses, lit either side of it and linking to each other in that area. And then we have the internal carotid arteries either side. So it's in this central location with an awesome blood supply, two major arteries and a major venous thingy. Now, um, the pituitary gland lying within that bony cavity is covered over by dura mater. So when we take off the bone, we find the dura mater, the thick connective tissue covering the brain. There are three layers of meninges, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, right? And the, the dura mater is the tough co covering. Now, when we're dissecting cadavers to study this, and we take the brain out, when we take the brain out, although the pituitary gland is attached to the brain and to the hypothalamus, more on that in a bit. Whenever we take the brain out, the pituitary gland remains within the skull. So the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus. I've done a whole video on the thalamus. The hypothalamus is hypo below the thalamus in the midline. Um, and the hypothalamus connects to the pituitary gland with a stalk. A pituitary stalk or infundibulum it gets called. Now the reason the pituitary gland gets left behind is because it's also covered by some dura mater. So it's, it's mostly covered over by dura mater and held down into the cella turcica with just the, the infundibulum, the stalk poking through. So when we pull the brain out the stalk tears and the pituitary gland gets held down. So that connective tissue, that dura mater covering 
the, uh, the pituitary gland gets called the diaphragma cella. It's like a diaphragm, cella, cella turcica. Yeah. Um, I've got so many models to try and show this with. So there's the pituitary gland, there's the sphenoid bone, um, and here's the thalamus here, and this is the hypothalamus there. So this then is the pituitary stalk, or the infundibulum, linking the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Um, right. I'm trying to do the anatomy, but without talking about what the gland does. Um, what do you guys know about the pituitary gland? So I said that it's a, an overall organizer, right? I mean, the reason I want to talk more about hormones now is because I'm bringing in the hypothalamus. But the pituitary gland makes adrenocorticotrophin hormone, ACTH, makes growth hormone, GH or HGH. Uh, it makes TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. It makes luteinizing hormone. It makes follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and that's the, the anterior pituitary. So the pituitary gland itself has three parts. It has an anterior pituitary, um, like a, an intermediate pituitary bit in the middle, and a posterior lobe. And the pituitary gland also has another name. It also gets called the hypophysis. Um, hypo below, physis growth, suggesting that it's a downgrowth from the brain. Now, in fact, the posterior lobe, which also gets called the neurohypophysis, or neurohypophysis, hypophysis, is indeed a downgrowth from the brain. And that bit is still directly connected to the, hypophysis, the hypothalamus up here. But the anterior lobe, also gets called the adenohypophysis, is actually an upgrowth from the roof of the mouth. So the anterior lobe is derived from oral ectoderm and the posterior lobe is derived from neurectoderm. And then there's an intermediate part in between the two and then we have the infundibulum or the infundibular stalk or the pituitary stalk linking the posterior lobe to the hypothalamus. Now the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is very glandular. It's filled with cells which are making all of those hormones that I just listed and prolactin. Might be the full list, I don't know. Anyway, so there's, there are several different types of cells in the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Each one is responsible for making, you know, a hormone or two. Um, and each of those hormones have downstream effects on other organs. So the adrenocorticotrophin hormone, ACTH, adreno, has an effect on the adrenal glands. Thyroid stimulating hormone has an effect on the thyroid glands. Uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, they have effects on the, the ovaries and so on and so on, right? Um, so those cells are very glandular, but in the posterior pituitary gland, if we look at those cells, they look more like nerves because they are. And there we find vasopressin, also known as ADH or antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin being released. So. ADH or vasopressin uh, has an effect on the kidney, doesn't it? And kidney function has an effect on regulating blood pressure. Resoxytocin is important in lactation uh, and uh, uh, preparing for labour and labour and that sort of thing, right? Um, now what's happening there is, is that the, the cells of the hypothalamus, the neurons there, they're actually making the vasopressin, but they're passing it down their neurons, down the infundibular stalk into the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, where it is stored and released when appropriate. Cool, huh? The intermediate lobe makes, or the intermediate part, makes melanocyte stimulating hormone, stimulating the melanocytes, and is pretty rudimentary in, in us humans. I think it's probably more important in some other animals, but those are the three parts there. So they. They're quite different, but they all live together in this same organ. Do you see how it's very difficult to stay on track and talk about the anatomy when you're talking about an organ like the pituitary gland, where it has, it's so busy, endocrine -y. Um, sorry. The point I'm trying to make is that the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are linked, partly because of that vasopressin and ADH link in the posterior part, but also in the blood supply. So, um, the, the arterial supply to this region, to the pituitary gland, comes from small arteries from the internal carotid artery, which makes sense, right, because it's right next to it. Um, but there is a hypophysial uh, portal system. Uh, and what that means is you have a capillary bed around the, um, the hypothalamus, and you have a capillary bed um, around the pituitary gland. 
and those two capillary beds are linked by um, by blood vessels. So that's a portal system linking the two capillaries, which means that in those physiological feedback loops that no doubt you've seen and read about, hopefully, with the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus and other organs, this, the hormones produced by the pituitary gland um, get passed into that, uh, the capillary bed and then pass, they can pass directly, because you've got to go a little way then, up to the hypothalamus and have an effect on the cells of the hypothalamus. So there's this little cool portal system there which you should be aware of linking the two. Of course, uh, most of the blood vessels around the brain uh, are, um, have tight junctions linking the endothelial cells together, giving that blood-brain barrier, right? Whereas around here, those capillaries are actually leaky, they're fenestrated, so the hormones can leak out and affect these structures. Now the venous drainage is from the pituitary gland into the into the cavernous sinus which is around here and then from the cavernous sinus the blood's going to pass to the uh, internal jugular vein and then drop down into the systemic circuitry system. So blood from the pituitary gland, when hormones are released into it, it gains the circuitry system very easily, which is quite nice. Now, um, what I was looking for was, see I've got my brain models here. All these brain models, they've lost their pituitary glands as well, because they did have pituitary glands hanging from pituitary stalks, but they've all broken off. And no doubt we've probably got a couple of plastic pituitary glands rattling around the lab somewhere, because they got dropped, broken off, not noticed and not picked up. But we can see on this model, we can see how the pituitary gland is, is very much here. We can see the infundibular stalk sticking up. You can see the two internal carotid arteries. And as this model shows the dura mater and the dural venous sinuses, you can get an idea of where the cavernous sinus is. So we've talked about the pituitary gland, where it is, the bone, oh, another bony bit, right? This is the sphenoid bone here, and there's the pituitary gland. This space here is the sphenoidal sinus. Right, now we've talked about the bone, uh, where the pituitary gland is, a bit of blood supply function and that sort of thing. There are a couple of interesting clinical things. Um, one, tumours of the pituitary gland occur, um, and adenomas. Now, if I said there are several different cell types within the anterior pituitary gland, um, and each of those cells will produce, uh, say, mostly produce one hormone. If a tumour forms from one of those types of cells, right, so you have one cell type, say for example it's producing growth hormone, and then that cell enters uncontrolled proliferation and starts to form a tumour and gets bigger. Not only will it form a tumour and get bigger and compress some surrounding structures, but also that ball of cells will then be probably producing more growth hormone than the pituitary gland should. So you'll see effects of too much growth hormone, which might be actually growth of bones in the extremities. And uh, for example, you might see complaints about carpal tunnel syndrome because um, everything's growing, the carpal tunnel's getting smaller, uh, maybe shoes not fitting, feet seeming to get bigger and that sort of thing. Signs of too much growth hormone. And likewise, you could have too much um, of a different type of cell producing a different hormone and producing other uh, physiological changes. So watch out for those and think back to the, the pituitary gland. Now the other thing anatomically is that if the pituitary gland enlarges, because it's surrounded by bone, it can only go up really. And it's covered over, as I said, by dura mater. But there's another structure up here as well, which we can just about see. What's that? Well, if we look here, we can see the two internal carotid arteries. We also see these two nerves going anteriorly. So these are the two optic nerves, cranial nerve two going to the retina on either side. Now what we don't see here is that these two optic nerves cross over superior to the pituitary gland. That's the optic chiasm. Uh, and that is, that is what we're seeing here. We're seeing the optic chiasm in section, so it's, it's an X, it's crossing in and out of the plane of section here. So that means that as a pituitary gland, if it starts to enlarge, it's gonna 
it's going to push on the optic chiasm, it's going to push on the optic nerves, which is then going to give some changes to vision. Um, we haven't done eyes yet, have we? Oh, that's a big one. So maybe I'll talk about uh, what those changes might be. But uh, suffice to say that oh, if you start on the eye, you go down a rabbit hole. But the retina, they take an image that's upside down, you have, and they cross over, and some, some cross over, some don't anyway. So the effect might be um, not so much a, a loss of vision, but a loss of visual fields. I'm going to stop there. If you want to know more about how the pituitary gland might affect vision, go and have a look online because honestly it is, uh, it is uh, a nice, interested, complicated thing, but I'm not going to get it across now. So there you go, the pituitary glands. Hopefully you could find that on transverse section MR or CT or, you know, coronal section or sagittal section. Um, it is in the midline. It's surrounded by the sphenoid bone. It has the two sorry, internal carotid arteries on either side and the cavernous sinus and it's linked to the hypothalamus. Know that if you've ever had a lecture um, or somebody's spoken to you about the pituitary gland, the first thing they'll do is, is tell you where it is. But there's a bit more information to, to layer on top of that. Hopefully that was useful. Since I've been talking about it this week, I thought I might share it. Right. See you boys and girls uh, next week. Same time, same place, same... Uh Seam Anatomy Lab. <laughs> right. Where did this brain come from? Is this one, is it?